Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this panel as part of the opening weekend of the Asia-Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art. Uh, my name is uh, Jose de Silva. I'm the head of the Australian Cinematheque here at the gallery. And thank you for joining us uh, early in the morning. Um, can I begin by uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which uh, we gather um, as an Australian and in, and in the spirit of uh, reconciliation, I pay my respects to elders both past and present. Uh, today we're joined by uh, three esteemed uh, practitioners who I, s who I guess in a sense have been at the uh, front line uh, of connecting uh, the Muslim community in Australia to the arts and then the wider community to works dealing with uh, religious and spiritual uh, engagement. Um, we have APT 8 artist Abdul Abdullah. We have artist and co-curator of the cinema project Pop Islam, Khaled Sabsabi, and uh, uh, Nur Shakembi, uh, a Melbourne-based artist, curator, and writer. And uh, what I'm hoping we might be able to do today is have uh, a discussion on the subject of religious and spiritual representation in contemporary art and uh, cinema. We had some really insightful conversations yesterday uh, about the framing of this representation, the problems of context, and of course, different ideas of perception, and I hope that we can try and relive some of that conversation today. Can I just begin by uh, introducing um, the three guests we have today? Um, Abdul, as I said, is an Australian artist working in Melbourne. In APT8, he has a series called Coming to Terms, uh, which presents a series of, uh, I guess, unusual wedding portraits that were taken in Malaysia, the, um, the birth country of his mother. And it's inspired by a 19th century uh, novel um, called The Moor. Um, Abdul was a finalist in the 2011 uh, Archibald Prize, and he won the Blake Prize for Human Justice in that same year. Most recently, his painting, I, want, I wanted to paint him as a mountain of uh, local artist and activist Richard Bell, uh, was a finalist for the 2014 Archibald Prize. Uh, Khaled, again, is also an Australian artist. He works in video and installation. Since the late 80s, he has been engaged with communities to develop projects that reflect on the complex nature of uh, identity, in particular the global connections between peoples and place um, that are facilitated by history, migration and technology. And as I said, Khaled has worked very closely with the gallery throughout the APT on the development of the cinema project Pop Islam, which I'll briefly uh, introduce shortly. And Noor is a contemporary artist, a curator and a writer. Uh, she was previously the art director and exhibitions manager at the Islamic Museum of Australia, uh, where she worked tirelessly uh, to raise community awareness of the arts with a focus on Australian uh, Muslim artists. Uh, for two years, she held the position of Arts and Cultural Committee for the Parliament of World Religions and remains an active proponent of the arts of interfaith. Um, please. Join me uh, in welcoming our guests. <laughs> so by way of uh, introducing uh, the conversation today, I thought it was uh, useful to, um, to just go back and think about the way that Islamic histories, customs and beliefs have featured in the APT, uh, most notably in the, in the last few APTs, um, and that might I've chosen just a couple of works which I think might also inform the discussion that we have uh, today. Um, in the past, we've seen the fusing of Islamic uh, aesthetics with contemporary culture and politics uh, in Muhammad Ashfaq's wall drawings and uh, Munir Sharudi Farman Farmian's mosaics. We've seen the omnipresence of God in Ayas Jokyo's architectural structure and a collision of the sacred and the profane in uh, Slavs and Tata's holy book turned uh, seating structure. We've seen a restaging of the Crusades in Kenya with uh, Muslim youth by in Wal Shorki's video, 
Uh, and in this APT, there is an extraordinary video upstairs by Kirk and Ergen called Ashura that documents a Shiite community in Istanbul uh, reenacting the Battle of Kabbalah. Um, this edition of the exhibition is perhaps uh, more explicit uh, in its framing of religious and spiritual representation, highlighting images of the contemporary Islamic world in very specific uh, local and transnational experiences. I can only speak for my own part in this process as the co-curator with Khalid of Pop Islam, one of the cinema projects that's part of the exhibition. And I won't talk too much today, but I just wanted to briefly say that uh, this is a, uh, a project that uh, proposes itself as a, uh, as a simple program of 55 film and video works, uh, and that it emerged r really from a desire to kind of create a platform within the exhibition that could express a diversity of uh, experience and opinion throughout the contemporary Islamic world. Uh, it has a pretty straightforward aim, uh, and that is really just to, of to offer local audiences a more uh, nuanced uh, representation of Islam uh, at a time when uh, religion continues to be both a polarizing subject uh, in Australian media and politics, and a source of division and violence globally. Uh, we need only look at the, um, the anti-Muslim rhetoric uh, in the news and social media following the tragic events of Paris uh, last weekend to see that we have still a long way uh, to go in building a deeper understanding. The program also uh, provides an opportunity to really just present some of the important works that have come out of the region in the last uh, 10 years, and that speak to very specific uh, uh, as I said, local and uh, uh, cultural situations. Um, without kind of making a blanket statement about all of the works, there are kind of some, you know, reoccurring concerns and that, that are that they express, I guess, in a sense, an unease between tradition and secularism uh, and national and religious identities, um, as well as just emphasizing the experience of spirituality within uh, the tapestry of uh, the everyday. That's probably, we can come back to thinking about um, that or talking about that, but um, I wanted to start by handing over to um, Abdul, um, who I thought um, it'd be great to hear from you a little bit about um, how you came to make your new series uh, coming to terms, uh, and in a sense, the way your practice has always been engaged with um, dealing or responding to some of those kind of irrational projections uh, towards Islamic uh, cultures. Cheers, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, this is a picture of, well, my name is Abdul Abdullah, but my entire name is Abdul Hamid bin Ibrahim bin Abdullah. And these are my two older brothers, Abdul Karim bin Ibrahim bin Abdullah and Abdul Rahman bin Ibrahim bin Abdullah. <laughs> my mother's from Malaysia and my father is a white Australian, but he converted in 1971 uh, and he was the secretary of the Federation of Australian Is Islamic Council. So we come from a quite a conservative background, but we've got an older sister who owns a boxing gym and three boys who all went to art school. So they've had to put up with a, <laughs> they've had to put up with a lot. Um, the, my oldest brother on stage right, I don't know, that side. <laughs> He, uh, he runs art departments in West Australian Correctional Services. And my other brother, Abdul Rahman, he's a sculptor and he's like uh, becoming pretty prominent now. He's uh, going to show in the Adelaide Biennale next year. He's doing pretty well. Um, but to give you a bit of my family context, I guess that's, that's what it's all about. Uh, I wanted to, I've kind of overloaded with slides here, so I'll go through them quite quickly. But I wanted to give you a roundabout way and how I got to the works that are on display here at APT. Um, when I went through, uh, before going through art school or deciding that I was going to be an artist, I studied journalism and inspired by people like John Pilger and that sort of thing and, and really wanting to strive for looking at things like social justice and, and inequality. Um, but I found that journalism didn't really suit my methodologies and my particular way of thinking. I'd, maybe my attention span wasn't long enough or I didn't like having a boss at all. So <laughs> yeah, I, I picked up an elective in art and it was a much more effective means, personally, a much more effective means for putting across an idea. Like with my, I never really want to prove a point with my work 
but I'd rather sort of like life proves points. What I'm trying to do is just is to examine those points and to question things. So this is the first photograph that I made, primarily when I was, especially through art school, I was a painter. Um, but in 2011, I had a show called Them and Us. Uh, and this was a title work from the show called Them and Us. And the tattoo on my ribs I got specifically for the work. So it's a Southern Cross and amalgamated with the crescent moon and star. And I was playing around with the amalgamation of these two uh, signifiers of these two symbols um, and looking at images from the Cronulla riots and the, the, the way that the Southern Cross had sort of been uh, hijacked, I guess, is a way of putting it by people who had their own sort of xenophobic or nationalist agenda. That's not to say that everyone who has a Southern Cross tattoo feels that way, but if someone's got a Southern Cross ta tattoo on their foot, I've you know, got a pretty good idea of their politics. Uh, <laughs> And this was the other image from the show called Assimilate. Um, this is a portrait of my father uh, and the word Assimilate. I, find I tr have trouble with the word Assimilate. I find it a little bit like people say, oh, you've assimilated quite well, but I was born <coughs> here. I'm kind of, this is just who I am because I am who I am. But my father, he's a white Australian he, and he essentially in 71 assimilated into ent an entirely foreign culture. So it was a, a new experience. He's got his, well, I've exaggerated his blue eyes, but you get the point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the idea that new migrants should assimilate, uh, it, the, I, find it, I, I find that really problematic. Like it's uh, maybe, and the example I use is say it's, uh, the wave of Italian migration after World War II. It's not the nonnas and poppers who've got like Aussie accents and you know, saying dinky die things, but it's their uh, kids and grandkids sort of thing. So that they still speak Italian. So the expectation for someone to, who's just arrived here to sort of get rid of everything they've ever learned. And uh, I thought, an entirely new culture, I think, is inappropriate and too difficult. Well, not too difficult, but yeah, not right. Uh, also in that show, I'll skip through these quite quickly, but I had a series of interviews with uh, people from a Muslim background who I grew up with, who, but who all had different uh, engagements with, that, with their religion. So this is Kabir Rockley. We didn't talk so much about religion, but he, uh, he held the record for the fastest knockout in mixed martial arts in the country for a long time, and he was also the the head of security at my local shopping centre. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Aisha. She, um, uh, she came from a, like, uh, her family, when uh, they first came to Perth, wasn't very religious, but she, she found, she became very religious. And she used to wear a full niqab, which is a face covering, and then she stopped wearing one. And we just talked about that journey. And then at the other end of the scale, we've got uh, Adnan, who came from a very, very conservative uh, background, uh, and he went, the, the other way. So he's, he's, a pretty, he's a staunch atheist and he, well, I shouldn't, oh no, that's fine. He'll be fine with it. Um, <laughs> yeah, and we just talked about his journey. And this is a portrait of myself, my father and my mother talking sort of about that generational difference where that, that conservatism coming up against, you know, someone having a bit of a rave. <laughs> I wanted to bring these ones in because these were paintings from a couple of years ago from a bad guy series where I've used the balaclava as this motif of a bad guy. So a, signal, a signifier or a symbol of a badness or criminality, uh, which a lot of people now associate with terrorism, and that's kind of deliberate in the way that I've used the, used the balaclava. But what's kind of funny with this image is it's a combination of different features. So we've got Kanye West's eye, Beyonce's eye, and Madonna's mouth. <laughs> sort of playing like gender bending and playing with a few different things. And when these were exhibited at the Art Gallery WA earlier in the, on in the year, they had a photo in the newspaper of me and my brother standing in front of them. And then there was letters to the paper the next day. There was complaints to the gallery that because people didn't even read the article. They just saw the combination of my name and then a picture of a head and a balaclava. And all of a sudden, like government money was being spent on supporting terrorism, and which, which is outrageous. started to get a little bit more hate mail. Um, I wish they'd spent a little bit more money on us. That would have been good. <laughs> but we went on terrorists, by the way. <laughs> I'll skip through. Now this one uh, was from a series called Homeland. Uh, and the sing that's a, it's called Self-Portrait as an Ultranationalist. And I'm wearing that singlet of the, I think it's quite a common sticker in Brisbane, as far as I know. I'm from Perth originally, and it's quite common there. When I showed the work in Melbourne, they, they, they'd never seen it before, and it was, they thought that I'd made it up. But these are all sort of things that I've brought together. And this is well before Reclaim or the uh, like United Patriots front. But uh, it's kind of a little bit haunting how it, it, it preempted them a little bit by a couple of years, this idea of that ultranationalist and what that means. And then this one's called I Want to Hold Your Hand, so uh, referencing 
VJ Day at Times Square, that famous black and white photograph off of World War II where a sailor's kissing a girl, but playing around with those signifiers again, where I'm having, uh, mixing up, it's an unexpected physical outcome between two people wearing particular clothes. And this one, it doesn't matter how I feel. It's hard for me to articulate this one, I mean, uh, but the idea of like that blacking out or like deleting of identity, or pushing back, and then your hand sort of these <coughs> these last sort of efforts to to make a difference. Uh, this body of work, which is a very this is from 2014, called Siege. Uh, again, a series of self-portraits. I'm not entirely self-portraits, but uh, there's another figure in there too. But it it sort of sums up the way that I feel and the, the projection of badness on a particular group of people. The mask is from the 2001 Planet of the Apes movie, the Marky Mark version. Uh, it's made by Rick, ba Rick Baker, the monster maker. Uh, and it's a ten-part series with each title in uh, the series making up a line in a poem. Not a rhyming poem necessarily, but a poem that sort of sums up the, the theoretical thrust of the body of work. So this one's called You See Monsters, uh, almost a, an accusation of the audience. Uh, we are blood and bone. We are sweat and tears. From the beginning they told us we were shit. We're the ones that look back from the abyss. They silence us in darkness. The disaffected byproducts of the colonies. Someone else's king and someone else's country. Watch it burn for peace. And the Arabic uh, on that jumper that says salam, uh, which means peace. So it's uh, like a message of peace, but it's really <coughs> funny. How oh, this jumper made, and if I wear this around the city, the looks I get are uh, hardcore. <laughs> and I wanted to show these ones uh, more uh, conciliatory uh, group of works that are attached to the coming to series that I've got here, but then they're not on display. They're in a slightly different, slightly different direction. But they're, they're, I guess, the what is it? The epilogue or the prologue that comes after the book? <laughs> Sorry? Is it the epilogue or the prologue that comes? Uh, the, pro yeah, the prologue. <laughs> so this is the prologue to the siege series, I guess. Uh, where I was in, while I was in Malaysia, I was fortunate enough to go to my, the, the village next to my mother's village and meet a monkey called Aki. And so this one's called Conciliation of Self, Reconciliation of Self, and Restitution of Self. Um, it was an interesting and a very humbling day to spend, because I had to spend a day with a monkey for him to be chill with me. <laughs> he really didn't like me at first. He like <laughs> he, the photographer that I was working with. He like he took to him straight away, but me, I had to like <laughs> had to give him heaps of these like these lollies. <laughs> and then these are the works that are on exhibit. So this this is, I guess this is one of the title pieces. This is called Zofloya or Groom One, and Zofloya is a book uh, came out in 1806 about a 16th century sort of romance, uh, but it's also called The Moor. And uh, it's particularly about a character who's this Moorish character. He's a slave, but they call they like they, he's described as a black Moor, and it sort of plays on anxieties of the Ottoman Empire that was bouncing around at the time. And he, in the book, he seduces the character Victoria, who's I've illustrated here, uh, and then reveals himself at the very end to be the devil. This is a wedding conspiracy to commit. Hey, this, uh, what, what the idea with the balaclavas is using that as a, as a signifier of criminality or a project, people projecting criminal tendencies on a group of people. And to give a little bit of context to this, I'll, I'll be quick. So the, uh, the, the, what it, how it started is that I was reading an article, I saw it on the news, I can't remember exactly, but it was, there was some collateral damage in one of the recent conflicts where some children had died and specifically some babies had died, but then there was some justification being banded about that they were going to grow up to be terrorists anyway. So it's okay in that sort of ugly dehumanizing on, of, of these kids who are by all accounts really innocent, like they haven't, yeah. So that, that, that dehumanizing, that monstrification or that abjectification of a group of people to justify like murder or, or killing, I, I found that really, really troubling. And I think that's a big issue that's happening at the moment, like othering the other, distancing the other to make it feel okay when they die. And, oh, sorry, I've skipped ahead. I don't have the other two photos that are in the series. But yeah, that's the last one. I hope that sort of gives a little bit of context and I haven't rambled. <laughs> Not at all. That's yeah. really great. I think one of the interesting topics that we were discussing yesterday um, was the way that um, the, the very kind of private experience of faith 
um, had been made very public after the events of 9-11. Um, and Nora, I wondered if you could perhaps um, talk a little bit to this, because what's interesting is that this was a kind of a major turning point in terms of the visibility of, uh, of Muslims international, internationally, and, and whilst it had um, uh, quite negative outcomes, it also had quite positive outcomes in terms of um, self-awareness and self-affirmation. Um, well, that's very well articulated <laughs> through the work of Abdul and his brother Abdrahman, who's also an artist that Abdul introduced to us earlier. And as a curator, I've worked with both brothers and the distinction between um, pre and post 9-11 is huge for many people in the Muslim community. Um, Abdul Rahman speaks of his work as a personal um, reflection or, or, or of childhood memories. Um, and pre 9-11, your religion or being Muslim was actually quite private. And most people were ambivalent to it. I grew up and went to school and um, my background is Albanian. I'd say I was Albanian Muslim and it, it didn't mean anything. Um, the celebrations you held at home, the fact that I didn't have Christmas or Easter, um, didn't eat pork, um, that was about it, that was d the distinction. Come after 9-11, um, and you'll see the difference, um, I, I encourage you to sort of Google, look up Abdurrahman's work, go to Abdul Abdullah's website as well, and you can sort of see the marked difference. Um, they're both sort of recounting personal stories um, and experiences as artists and you can see the difference in their work. And um, Islam became a very public um, commodity after 9-11. And what is essentially private and personal um, part of your spirituality, and oftentimes not even. Um, Muslims are pretty much like most other people. People might say I'm, I'm Christian or Catholic or whatever it might be. and. Um, you know, it, it's more cultural. It might be just the fest festivities that you celebrate or the certain things that you partake in. Um, but that suddenly became politicised. And um, 20 years ago, when I first put um, hijab on, um, the, the headdress, um, I was considered sort of a quaint interest. And it was sort of innocuous, there was, it, it was benign. Um, there was no threat. It was almost maybe exoticised, you know, related to your Thousand and One Nights or the harems or, you know, the Far East. Um, after 9-11, suddenly the hijab was a politicised symbol. Um, you're a jihadi bride, you're a terrorist, you're, you know, it was associated with violence and a lot of negativity. And I think um, looking at the development of contemporary art within the Muslim community, you can really see the shift um, pre and post 9-11, most definitely. And it's almost like um, the art is reflecting a reality that a lot of people felt after that period of time where I had friends um, that were in the workplace and pretty much, um, you know, the Islam and Muslims were being slagged out, you know, in the lunchroom and because people didn't realise that they were actually working with Muslims, that they had colleagues that were Muslim. So many women actually put the hijab on after 9-11 to make the statement that I am Muslim. And many took it off because of the abuse and violence and <coughs> the attention that it attracted. So it sort of had um, a bit of a polarising effect in the community. But um, the important point being it forced us to, in a way, um, have to speak about or really um, articulate what being, being an Australian Muslim was at that time. Especially when you're being told by your Prime Minister at that time, you're either with us or against us. Um, and that's a really awful thing to have. Um, you know, that's th that pressure and that question um, immediately sort of discounts you from the wider community and immediately questions who you are as an Australian. Um, and just the development of the work with contemporary Muslim artists post 9-11, um, in a way, just because they are sort of sharing what is 
their Muslim identity, it immediately is read as political. Some of the work may be um, quite spiritual. For example, um, Khaled's works are amazing and much of it is steeped in his um, reverence for Islam as a faith. Not, not in a way that he's trying to preach that to anyone, but it's just part of who he is. And um, without knowing that, you can look at Khalid's work and it is quite um, political. And um, with Abdul and his work, it's been such a pleasure and an honour to have curated um, Abdul's work in the past. And, um, you know, as a Muslim, I find that his work is quite confronting. And I don't mean in terms of censorship or anything along those lines. I mean in terms of... Um, I feel I, I can't even look at um, uh, Siege and some of the works where Abdul's put a monkey mask on and he's demonising himself in a way or he's actually reflecting back to the audience. Um, it's almost like calling out the bullying, it's calling out the racism and it's really hard to see. I find it, it's actually quite an emotional thing for me um, because you know, he's, he's actually, he's making the audience own, own it. So if you ever um, did think that, or assume that Muslims are violent or they're monsters, you know, this is being pretty much put back at you in such a very profound um, and powerful way through a visual image. Um, yes, yeah, so I actually find that quite confronting as a Muslim. Um, and I'm not quite sure, maybe when we have our question and answer time, if um, people in the audience, you know, I'd love to hear from you, how you find that imagery, if you found that confronting at all, or um, how that made you feel <coughs> as well. Um, one of the very first works that you sh showed at the Islamic uh, Museum of Australia was Khaled's um, incredible multi-channel uh, work, Mush. Um, and Khaled, you know, um, the question of uh, representation is at the kind of heart of your practice or how I understand it. Um, and the kind of question of what could be represented or how you can create an image when, um, uh, when creating might be prohibited in, in, in some sense. I wondered if you could maybe talk to us a little bit about your um, practice and how you've kind of sought to, uh, uh, to, to work through these um, questions. And you can flick through some. You got it. Oh, thanks. No, 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 no. Yep. Oh. Right here. Not the boys. There we go. That's a picture of Marsh. So, uh, absolutely, Jose. I think. Um, um, for me, my journey's been uh, very different. I mean, everyone here is different, and I acknowledge everyone else in this room is very different, and their experience is very different, and how this uh, comes about and forms an identity um, or a self um, is, again, different and unique. Um, so I think um, well, what I might say is very, very briefly, see, I grew up, my circumstances, I grew up in in, uh, in, uh, in Lebanon. I was born in Lebanon, Tripoli. And uh, I grew up around a household of a pan-Arab um, uh, pan front. And those of you don't under or don't know what pan-Arab is, it's the unity of the Arab nations or the Arab League. And that was uh, influenced and um, prompted by Jamal Abdel Nasser, the Egyptian leader of 56 to 72. And, um, and you saw, you know, the, the birth of Saddam and Hafez al-Assad and Gaddafi and so on and so on. And that was the whole sort of movement. So I grew up in that sort of household due to civil war. We migrated here in 79 and I grew up in uh, Western Sydney. I've always had a, um, a view to find an alternative. Um, an alternative being taken out of one place, put into another. So there's already a duality at conflict here within the self. Now that duality of conflict within the self, how it evolves is again different and it's time-based. So that may evolve to, for someone to react, express, or um, work towards a spiritual self, some sort of finding of, of yourself. So that's, that's it in brief. I've always you know, worked with communities and so on. And my work is in, 
is, is anchored in, in social awareness and, uh, and, a, um, and a commitment to have, um, to have a, a, a voice for the marginalised and so on. That's in very brief, and you can Google practice and so on, you'll find more about that. So, um, with MUSH now, I've evolved over time, so I've always expressed some very random works, I've done some very random works, um, works that are uh, quite uh, literal in their delivery, and then other works that are, you know, um, a bit more sort of um, <laughs> deeper in their thinking and, and their, and their um, way that you could, that can be interpreted or, or read. Much in particular for me, um, the restrictions is this, and go back to Jose's qu um, uh, point, that as, as, a, as a Muslim artist, now Islam is very interesting as well, and it's very diverse, and I'm not going to give you a, a history of uh, lesson on Islam, and it's, it's, it's complexity and, and uh, uh, layered approach of practice, yeah? We won't do that, because again, you could find that. But for me, the thing is, it's a, a, essentially about representation. So you, as a Muslim artist, will always need to keep in mind this relationship of representation and the taboos or, or not to do um, uh, uh, represent um, creation. So this is one, one form. So how do you deal with that? And the other thing is you also have this history and you have thousands of years of history that, um, that, you, know, that you bring uh, along with you um, and that informs your practice as well. And that's either learned or inherited or whatever, you know, whatever your belief is. For Marsh in particular, I'm interested in the metaphysical. So here, it's, it's a digital work. It's a six-channel digital work. And it's a moving image. I mean, this is a still, but you can see it folds and folds and folds to a point, to an infinite point. And it sort of, it, it doubts the viewer. It, makes, it puts the viewer in two, in two thoughts. So they doubt themselves um, and they question. Okay, I can see what's in front of me. My eyes say this, there's an infinite. But in reality, I know that there is no infinite. So there's all already these two opposing uh, streams that are happening within this work. The uh, representation of the cube is, of course, the Kaaba uh, in Mecca. Now, the Kaaba for Muslims is, is a very old building. It predates Islam. It's the house of Abraham, uh, peace be upon him. So the, the symbolism in its form, what's happening as well, it's clear where it's being, um, where it's being inspired from. You only put that one? Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's much. And there was another eight-pointed star uh, because numbers are very important as well in, 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 uh, in Islam as well. Um, and for scholars to understand these, uh, uh, the meaning of numbers as well. Um, do you want to go on to another one? Or yeah. yeah? This is another work called 70,000 Veils. And, uh, much was, I think, in 2011, uh, and much was in 2014. This was shown in Marrakesh Biennial, but it was also shown at Milani Gallery, and it's touring as well. So this was a 100-channel uh, video work. It took about seven years. Much, much took about eight years to put together. So the idea with Mush was to um, bring everything in my travel and collide it together and produce this infinite thing. That was much. With 70,000 veils, it was, again, because the spirituality is really anchored within the, within the individual. Um, and that's how Islam really works. There's no collective as such. The, the, uh, the individual within uh, choice and action and intention is what forms you know, the spiritual um, connection to the divine. 70,000 veils, here again, it, inspired by the Prophet, peace be upon him, Muhammad, who said that there are 70,000 veils between the individual and the divine, none between the divine and the individual. Now Rumi, Jalal al-Din Rumi, who in the West is known as a poet, but he was a Sufi of the Mavlavi order, or Mawlawi order, 
in, in Turkey, Persia migrated to Turkey in Konya, and there he rests. 70,000 vowels, Rumi expands the idea. So over seven years, I, seven or eight years, I, I, I keep thinking about what does this 70,000 mean? It, how does it relate to the individual? Where is the spiritual within, where is the divine within all this? I bring it back to the self. So uh, I took 10,000 images, stripped them back to 70,000 Photoshop layers, and then reconstructed them back to a 100 channel moving video. And they tally up to be seven, 70,000 seconds collectively. Um, it's in 3D. Why 3D? Because 3D acts as a threshold for the viewer. So you may walk into this work, you will feel the heat of this work, and you will look at it and you'll go, yep, yeah, okay, I'm fine. So it represents life, and you may walk out. You put the glasses on, and then you're transported into another realm. So the 3D effect acts as a threshold, placing the glasses onto, um, onto your head, uh, acts as a threshold into crossing into another realm. And um, this was a way to symbolize 70,000 memories. So what I locked it down to is that, <coughs> excuse me, is it something that we take with us that we, I mean, we all have these questions, spiritual, non-spiritual, religious, non-religious. We all ask ourselves these questions. We all doubt, you know, um, and, uh, and, and, and think about these, these questions. So would it be the memories that you take with you? Would these memories be the actions that you take with you? Or would they be that, these things that you would leave behind as well? Beyond this facade, there's another picture, which I don't know, no, no, the boys, there tomorrow. Um, that's all we have, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So be, beyond this here is, I intentionally gave access to the viewer, to the audience, to be able to go behind this. So behind this is neatly tied cables thousands of cables stitched together and weighed down uh, to give you the idea of order. So, um, in a way, is it to demystify spirituality? Maybe. Is it to uh, expand it? Is it to break it down, to simplify it? Whatever it may be. So, um, that's, that's 70,000. I'll stop here. Let's, let's move on. Okay. Um, Khaled, I wondered if you could, before we take some questions from the audience, just um, perhaps um, give people a little bit of insight into what you have prepared for us tomorrow um, with the Anashid performance. Okay, um, so Pop Islam will open tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, for us it's a really exciting program, it's a really exciting opportunity. Why for us? I think to be able to um, uh, you know, um, it's, it's nothing new. I mean, we talk uh, pre-9-11 and post-9-11 and, and so on. But um, like I said, you know, this, um, this distrust has been going on back to the Crusades. So history has always had this tension, you know, with, uh, with Islam or European history. Um, and there's always been this sort of... Uh, uh, distrust. So for us, it's an excellent opportunity tomorrow for Pop Islam and, and Jose has been uh, phenomenal and the Goma team has been phenomenal in working together and putting a really, I mean, how, how do you stitch a program that is possibly going to reflect uh, almost 30% of the world's population um, and you have 1,400 and nearly 60 years. You have ethnicities, you have cultures, you have traditions that are, that are fused both with the teachings and with the, the locality um, and call it Pop Islam. 
Um, so it's, it's been a challenge um, to be able to give a, a snapshot and, and, um, of, of this complexity. Uh, and that's the exciting thing about it. And uh, I think, um, you know, we've, um, uh, we've, we've brainstormed, we've, um, we've spoken about, and uh, we've researched, and um, along with Nord as well, to be able to put a, a program that, that, well, we hope captures some of this, this, um, this complexity. I think the important thing that um, Jose has achieved with this, uh, and it's always difficult when you are working to, in a way, represent a community that you're not a part of, although we are part of the human community and the wider community as Australians, but when you're looking at a minority community um, and trying to curate um, works sensitively, um, I think what's happened with Pop Islam, which is really great, is that rather than sort of trying to nail down um, or describe um, Islam, it's actually opening up a conversation around it. So it's not about trying to contain um, a, a, a um, explanation or a thought about Islam. Mm. It's actually about um, tweaking your curiosity and saying, well, hang on a minute, this is quite diverse. Um, you'll walk away feeling like you know less, which is a good thing. Because a lot of people, um, the issue has been, they think they already know everything about Islam and Muslims. And that's where the stereotyping and the negative sort of interactions come into play. So to walk away and say, well, hang on a minute. Um, wow, I didn't know there were, you know, um, Muslims that do this or, you know, there's guys like Abdul out there and, and you know, it opens up your mind rather than trying to, you know, shut it down and, and give you a nice packaged and neat sort of explanation. For tomorrow? Yes. We have uh, Rafai Qadri Jailani uh, group from, uh, from Sydney and they're, they're on their way to Brisbane right now. There'll be eight of them, and they'll be performing Anashid, which are Islamic songs. And uh, as, as, a, um, uh, as a, um, a respectful gesture to the program. And um, these are um, uh, vocal songs uh, performed with a percussive uh, instrument, which is a duff. And um, it would be quite... Um, quite soothing, so that'll be on at 10.30, uh, followed by um, uh, Film al uh, Risale, The Message by Mustafa Akkad. Um, and we chose this film, uh, it, it is about the uh, Prophet's uh, uh, life, peace and blessings be upon him. And um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an important film, and Mustafa Akkad is an imp important filmmaker. Um, and, I mean, he, he, his life, uh, he, you know, um, he, he, his professional career was established in Hollywood and he produced the early John Carpenter films and Halloween and created that genre of the slash. And then from there he went to make two films, which was The Risale, or The Message, and The Lion of the Desert, with Anthony Quinn in both films. And um, it's, look, uh, the film, uh, throughout um, the, um, the film, the prophet, uh, you, you know, you don't see, there's no representation. Uh, it's, it's symbolized by it. uh, music. <laughs> don't give it away. And, um, no, it's important because I think that's the first time it's probably happened in a feature. It's probably the only time. The only time. Protagonist doesn't feature. You don't, you don't hear the uh, lead role say anything. And um, it's, um, we hope um, you are able to attend it. I'm clearly, because I have such bad time management skills, I'm being told to wind it up. There is, um, there's an enormous program for the opening weekend, and I do ask you to pick up one of these guides, which will show you that everything that's on. Um, the first component of the cinema program is out, and you can pick this up as well. Um, but please join me in uh, 
thanking our three guests today. <laughs>